Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the modern aesthetic, so coinciding with chapter 3.8 in your textbook. So now, in the 19th century, we've already been talking about the Salon or the French Academy that had that hierarchy of artwork where history paintings was at the top, uh, still life paintings were at the bottom. So in the 19th century, the Academy was still a measure for success of artists. In the year 1863 alone, nearly 3,000 artworks were actually rejected. So this prompted the initiation of what was called the Salon des Refusés. It was opened in 1863 by Napoleon III and basically means Salon of the Refused or Rejected. So in the French Academy or the Salon, jurors tended to be conservative, resulting in the rejection of many works by new young artists trying to work in a new style. The Salon des Refusés was the first time works of art rejected from the annual Salon were displayed for the public to see. Many works that were rejected went on to change the art world actually for the better, but were considered bad by the Academy and praised by avant-garde artists. When we get to the roots of Impressionism, we're really, really looking at some very rebellious and giving the standards of the time, radical artists, working very much against conservative forces. This meant giving up, potentially, the security of money and of your reputation that was given to rising stars in the Academy. Some would be fortunate enough to secure forward-thinking gallery owners to promote their work, but many would be poor and rely on family money. So we're going now to take a look at a particularly influential work that was shown in the 1863 exhibition of rejected art. This is the image that you see here, Manet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe, also French for luncheon on the grass. So a good way to show the discrepancies between the avant-garde and the salon conservatives is to compare Manet's Luncheon on the Grass with another artist known as Cabanel with his artwork, The Birth of Venus. Both of these paintings are from 1863. However, they treat the same subject, mainly the female nude, in completely different ways. So I'm going to pause here for about 30 seconds and I want you guys to just look at these two paintings. Manet's on the bottom, shown in the Salon du Refusé, Cabanel's on the top that was accepted into the Salon. I want you to pay particular attention to how the woman, how the female form is represented and perhaps how her personality might play into this. So go ahead and take 30 seconds and just take a look and compare and contrast these two images in your mind. So let's start with Cabanel. Cabanel offers a typical traditional image. We can see the smooth blending and the careful modeling of the paint. This makes the image appear to be an illusion of the world. It's also a very sensual mythological painting of a woman. The quote unquote proper way to depict a woman without clothes was to classicize it to reference an appropriate subject from Greek or Roman mythology was a popular way to do this. Here, 
we have the birth of Venus from the sea. Think back to Botticelli's birth of Venus, the same kind of representation. Venus is the goddess of love and beauty, a popular subject and an exemplar for a beautiful woman. In fact, one could argue that Cabanel is simply depicting a nude woman. Adding the title Venus classicizes it, but it is clearly a nude. Manet, on the other hand, depicts his nude woman as just that, a woman from 1963 Paris who is nude and not hiding behind the masquerade of a mythological guise. Thus, here we must ask ourselves the difference between nude and naked. There is a moral sort of distinction. The model for the woman in the foreground was also known by the Parisian public. Her name was Victorine Miron. She also posed for Manet's painting of Olympia, which you would have read about in your textbook. So Manet has this modern Parisian woman confronting the viewer. She looks directly out at the canvas or out at us, and she is absolutely not classicized in the manner modern Parisians were accustomed to, like in Cabanel's painting. Manet was an established painter in France, and he's attempting to change the perspective of art from within the academy. He actually submits Déjeuner Célèbre to the salon, and in this he brings to his composition many elements perhaps the academy would have recognized, but ultimately in a way that changes or challenges these ideals. So firstly, he's actually referencing Renaissance sources. We have in Manet's painting a clear reference to the sort of classical pastoral subject, uh, think to Titian's work and these other painters of the High Renaissance where you have these classical scenes set in a landscape. So now Manet is translating this classical pastoral subject into contemporary terms. Rather than historical or mythological subjects, we have modern and recognizable individuals Manet actually knew in Paris. The men would have been recognizable to contemporary viewers as artists or students based on their clothing. And in this comparison especially, we see the departure of Manet from the smooth naturalism used in the illusionistic painting that seemed or that had been so revered from the Renaissance. When we compare the trio of figures from Manet's painting to, say, Raphael's depiction in the lower right, the borrowing of the scene is very clear. So we have an implied pyramidal composition that was very popular in classical painting from the Renaissance uh, to imply a stable and harmonious composition. However, with the shocking addition and replacement of modern bourgeois men who accompany the woman in this outdoor picnic. Moreover, this comparison makes clear that Manet is challenging the kind of painting accepted by the, the Academy. Rather than carefully blending colors using techniques like chiaroscuro, he is painting in broad, flat planes and with broken paint strokes. The figures are almost like silhouettes rather than a sense of natural volume. Overall, this seems to collapse the space and flatten the forms. But what this does is call attention to the very nature of the object. Not that the painting is an illusionistic window into another world, as was thought in the Renaissance, but an actual acknowledgement of the two-dimensional canvas and the physical application of the paint that was or would be would become so revered in the late 19th century. This was an absolutely revolutionary way of painting and was of course hated by the Academy. But this also brings us into important movements that it, you guys may be more familiar with 
uh, such as Impressionism or Cubism with, with Picasso that we will also be talking about in the following slides. With Impressionism, we can see that the comparison with Cabanel demonstrates that the conservative and traditional artists at this time are still trying to continue with older forms of painting and are not yet interested in new expressions. When artists like Monet, Cezanne, and Renoir, who were all about a generation younger than Monet, would see luncheon on the grass in the Salon des Refusés, they felt that they had seen a new path for art. While Manet never considered himself an Impressionist, those artists who did often hailed Manet as their inspiration. This new style, though it looked to examples like Manet, would emerge as distinct from realism into something different. This style is called Impressionism. Impressionism is a late 19th century art movement that sought to capture a fleeting moment, thereby conveying the elusiveness and impermanence of images and conditions. So some stylistic characteristics are quick, sketch-like brushstrokes, capturing spontaneous moments, depicted effects of light and atmosphere, rejected varnish and a finished look, and often painted, painted in a process known as en plein air, which meant that they were painting outdoors in the open rather than in a studio. The Impressionists, as far as the key artists go, include Monet, Degas, Renoir, and a female artist, Berthe Marisot, they depicted modern subject matter. Each of them had their individual styles, but they were all united in rejecting the formal approach of the academy. Because the way they were making art was in opposition to the art sponsored by the academy, the form, they formed a group to show their work outside the official salon. So typically painted scenes from everyday life as their subjects, you have rural landscapes, depictions of life in the modern and growing cities of Europe, and especially scenes of the middle class engaged in leisure, as was seen in Manet's painting. But there's two innovations that made it easier than ever to paint outside, basically directly from nature occurring in the 19th and 20th centuries. First, there was improved transportation. So whether you're traveling by train or motor car, people could get farther, even faster. The second innovation was the paint tube. Before this invention, artists had to mix and store their own paint. Tube paint was portable, stayed wet, and could be used from any location. Monet's Impression Sunrise, painted in 1872, was hung at the first Impressionist exhibition in 1874. A critic's negative response to the artwork actually coined the term Impressionism. It was meant to be derogatory, but it was actually embraced by these artists by the third Impressionist show in 1878. It's important to remember once again how different and radical this kind of painting is for the time, which is why the critics responded so negatively. Academically trained artists followed traditional methods founded in Renaissance principles. A highly polished and refined finish as to make the canvas appear like an illusion of nature. Distinguished brushstrokes in order to make that illusion as convincingly as possible. For instance, um, when we talked about Michelangelo, Raphael, you can barely see the brush strokes in the paintings. And they would also choose a very natural color palette. So the Impressionists, as we see with Monet, is attempting to capture the essence of light glittering on the water in the harbor. There is no attempt to disguise the brush strokes or blend pigments for smooth tonal transitions, 
we can see that the light in the sky, as well as the water, appears very choppy. So it's an acknowledgement of the paint and the surface of the canvas, rather than using the canvas as a tool to create an illusion. So neither purely objective descriptions of the exterior world, nor solely subjective responses. An impression kind of exists between the two. There's also careful observation of the optical effects of color and how color mixes optically within our brains. For instance, when we see red and yellow dots close together, they appear orange, even though they don't physically mix. Painting outdoors are on plein air painting allowed the artist to focus on the roles of light and color. Masks and smokestacks in the background suggest the industrialism that was a major feature of the second half of the 19th century in France. In Renoir's Moulin de la Galette, painted in 1876, we can see that Impressionists commonly chose to paint the urban middle class at leisure. This painting shows people at a popular outdoor cafe in Paris. We can see the use of spontaneous brushstrokes and the subject matter really create a kind of cheerful atmosphere. The painting technique in the scene were meant to evoke a world of beauty and pleasure. The depiction of light here is visually distinct from anything we have seen in art so far. It's dappled, even seemingly shifting. Imagine as you're standing in a park on a sunny day, as the wind blows through the trees, you can see the light kind of shimmering along the ground as the leaves move. So this is reflecting light as it appears in nature rather than in a studio. So Renoir is attempting to capture the optical sensations of light in our everyday life through a new technique of using fluid brushstrokes, colored shadows rather than using black, and an overall light color palette. What this emphasizes is the here and now the pleasure of a moment, rather than creating a sort of timeless image like the birth of Venus. These flickering brushstrokes actually recall our sensations of light, color, and movement. Although Impressionism was avant-garde in the 1870s, by 1886, Impressionism was accepted by the public as a serious art form. However, with this acceptance, their methods became less revolutionary and more consumed by the middle class. So younger generations start to push the concepts of the Impressionists even forth farther, in part due to some of the criticism that Impressionism had received from art critics which thought that Impressionism lacked discipline, training, or a more intellectual substance to their art. So these critics seem to be kind of too caught up with beauty. The painters of this time still retain roots in Impressionism, but it is not stylistically homogeneous, so it is called post-Impressionism. Artists of the potion impress or of the potion post-impressionistic period will respond to the criticism of impressionism in different ways. So some stylistic char characteristics, the methods used in painting are often scientifically based, abstraction of form and color is emphasized, and they tend to focus on subjective content. So the term post-impressionism is used to describe the stylistically heterogeneous work of the group of the late 19th century painters in France who more systematically examined the properties of expressive qualities of line, pattern, form, and color more so than the Impressionists. Landscapes, or images of natural scenery, remained a popular subject in the late 19th and early 20th century. Driven in part by their dissatisfaction with the modern city and with industrialization, many artists sought 
out places resembling untouched earthly paradises. In these areas, away from the bustle of the modern city, artists were able to focus on their work and observe nature firsthand. Because of this, many radical artistic experiments occurred in the most rural and least quote-unquote modern of settings. These ranged from the use of unexpected, non-naturalistic colors to unusual application of paint. Sometimes artists sought out the psychological and spiritual effects of the landscape as well. This painting by Paul Cezanne, known as Mount Saint Victoire, Cezanne painted this view of a mountain from his childhood home in the Aix en Provence of France many, many times. He essentially captures the eternal essence and endurance of the mountain. The forms in space are flattened and abstracted, and he blends warm and cool colors to create a kind of push-pull effect for the viewers. Cezanne felt that what had made painting great in the past was structure and order. As a result, his work grew increasingly abstract, profoundly affecting future artists. Cezanne had a different theorization of vision. Basically, as it appears, focusing on the concept of movement. So he explored the properties of line, plane, and color, and their interrelationships. He uses hue to imply depth rather than value. There are multiple lines and planes, so it is resistant to the sort of fixed nature as you would see in a photograph. Instead, these seem to register, quote unquote, little sensations of color, as he would recall. Impressions of color shimmering in the sun during a hot day, for example. Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night was a painting that we have already talked about. He painted this in 1889. We discussed how he lived with the artist Paul Gauguin for a few months in the south of France. He also struggled with mental illness and eventually committed suicide in 1890. So his style of painting is thick impasto, so that thick application of paint. So it's an act of applying paint that is very physical. As was characteristic of other post-impressionistic work, Vincent van Gogh here mixes observation, so objective data, with his unique expression and interpretation, something that is subjective. This is actually his view from the Asylum for the Insane, where he was staying later in his life. Historians have actually matched the view of the constellations and the cypress trees to view from the window at the asylum at St. Paul de Massol. So what we see here is that it is not just a landscape, but a landscape that is infused with his emotions at the time. His use of color kind of forcibly expresses himself. So let's take a look at the sky. Instead of representing the appearance of an actual night sky, he imbues it with his feelings. We see this kind of electrifying vastness of the universe, whirling and exploding stars, Earth and humanity are kind of huddled beneath all of this activity. So it is very personally expressive rather than just being a recreation of nature. So you can think of these avant-garde artistic movements as embodying both influences from nature as well as the artist's own imagination. When we get to the 20th century, we will see that there are certain historical events that completely change how the artwork appeared. So as far as the history, firstly, you have technological innovations. So the invention of the aircraft, automobile, radio, telephone, more global communication as well. Scientific expansion in psychology, physics, and other avenues. You also have societal changes. Between 1900 in 1945, you have the rise of communism, fascism, Nazism, and you also have the Great Depression. In World War I, between 1914 and 1918, 
there were around 20 million deaths. In World War II, between 1937 and 1945, there were 40 to 50 million deaths. A movement in Western art that developed in the second half of the 19th century and sought to capture the images and sensibilities of the age. So this art goes beyond simply dealing with the present and involves the artist's critical examination of the premises of art itself. So this begins as a rejection of the ideas and cultural baggage of the 19th century. It includes many different and distinct styles. It also often aligns itself more commonly with the term avant-garde, again, a term that in art refers to battle to advance the progress of art, especially against the resistance of conservative forces. So the first of these is Fauvism. Fauvism is an early 20th century art movement led by Henri Matisse, in which color became the formal element most responsible for pictorial coherence and the primary conveyor of meaning. So color is completely freed from simply describing the appearance of objects. It becomes in itself an independent expressive element. There is a sense of harmony and well-being. Color is created or is manifested as a sort of paradise in itself. So here we are left with this very modernist idea for art, that the purpose of painting was not to represent the perceptual world, but to use visual elements to take the viewer beyond perceptual reality. So we see color being freed from its use for pictorial illusionism and instead being used as an independent expressive element, particularly in Matisse's Woman with a Hat, painted in 1905. This actually depicts his wife, Amélie, and we see him exploring the expressive nature of color and form. So this is an influential and unique style, expressive forms, it's very decorative. We can see that it has a bold use of color. It is absolutely not naturalistic. We see a sense of pure color being represented here. We can also see the intense complementary color schemes in this painting, which is perhaps why critics would often call this painting a kind of wild technique. There's a radical departure from the traditional use of color by artists supported by the Academy. Matisse was not necessarily interested in copying nature, but instead interested in replicating or visualizing sensations. So this is a way to express emotions, being bold rather than being subdued. Take a look at this image as well. This is another one by Matisse, The Joy of Life. Take a look for about 20 seconds. I want you to think about how you guys would describe this image. What is the sort of emotive impact of color as well? So go ahead and take about 20 seconds to look at this image. All right, so taking a look at it, we can see that the scene is very bright. As well, we have already talked about the emotional impact of colors, that depending on the color, we all have certain associations. You find oranges, reds, uh, yellows, these warm colors as being more associated with happiness, whereas blues, greens, uh, purples are more associated with a calmness. So here we get that sense of excitement, but also a calm sense with the large planes of warm and cool colors, mainly or uh, predominantly warm. So we can see where the emphasis on color inciting emotion is happening in the Fauvist movement. So Fauvism would only last for a brief time 
but its impact on artists was clear. Between 1905 and 1920, we have the movement known as Expressionism. Expressionism describes any style where the artist's subjective feelings take precedence over objective observation. So artists focus instead on depicting what they feel rather than what they see. So this often is a result of the artist's unique inner and personal vision. Expressionists explored ways of portraying emotions to their fullest in intensity. So some of the characteristics would be exaggerating and emphasizing colors and shapes, departing from direct representation, focusing on inner states of being, and again, depicting what they felt rather than what they saw. Self-portraits as well were a way to explore the greatest variety and intensity of emotions. Particularly in Germany, we'll see that there's certain expressionistic movements. The movement Die Brücke, or also known as the Bridge, was founded in Dresden in 1905. These artists wanted to build essentially a bridge through which their art could reach a better, more enlightened future. Dar Blue Writer, or the Blue Rider, was organized in 1911 by the painter Wassily Kandinsky and his friend Franz Marc. In their opinion, they believed that spirituality and art were linked. So, as we'll move through the next few images, we'll see different types of expressionism, but we will see how this is more of an emotional visualization of the artist rather than what they are actually seeing. So Ernst Ludwig Kirchner is a German expressionist. He was the leader of the group called Die Brücke or The Bridge. Again, that's the group that thought of itself as the bridge between the old age and the new. So they looked to medieval German art as well as the craft guilds. Kirchner's style can be characterized by flat planes, intense color, and rough, aggressive brushwork. At the time this was painted, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner was 28 years old and living in Dresden, a large city in, the, in southeast Germany. His studio, which was a former butcher shop, was the meeting point for the artist group The Brook, formed in 1905, of which he was the founding member. In a letter to fellow painter Eric Haeckel, he wrote of the Dresden crowds, quote, completely strange faces pop up as interesting points through the crowd. I am carried along with the current lacking will. To move becomes an unacceptable effort, end quote. During the 19th century, Dresden's population quadrupled from 95,000 in 1849 to nearly 400,000 in 1900 as the result of a boom in industry, particularly food processing and the production of medical equipment. By the time this picture was painted, Dresden had over 500,000 inhabitants. The scene depicted in Street Dresden is the fashionable King Street, where wealthy inhabitants went to shop and to socialize. So taking a look at this, let's look at how Kirchner expresses his opinion of the city in this painting. So firstly, we see that the painting provides a frenzied, bustling view of the city. There is a sort of jarring and dissonance in the color and the composition. We can see the face of these women has a sort of greenish or orange tone, very unnatural. People seem to also threaten the viewer's space. We see these kind of odd people. We do not know these figures that are kind of protruding into our space. Figures are rendered as being ghoulish, garish, jarring, or distorted. So it's a sort of commentary on the decadence of those who are in power and the bad effects of industrialization. So for example, we see the alienation of individuals in a city. 
So as a result of industrialization, society itself is seen as becoming too mechanized and impersonal. And this would only become more intensified with the approach of World War I. Wassily Kandinsky was another Russian expressionist, although he was part of the Blue Rider period rather than being part of the bridge. Kandinsky is considered the pioneer of non-objective art, so something that does not represent the natural world. And it reflects the turmoil of time, but not as a specific event. So it is made spontaneously without a plan for the final outcome. Later artworks, as we will see, will start to avoid recognizable objects and instead use shape, line, and color to express inner spirituality. So science, spirituality, and the arts. Together with Franz Marc, who was the founder of the movement Der Blue Rider, or the Blue Rider period, the artists selected the name because of their mutual interest in the color blue and the symbolism of horses. Kandinsky saw these abstractions as a guide for a more enlightened and liberated society. What is more, Kandinsky considered the stability of the Enlightenment, or science, unstable with the split of the atom. So once the kind of scientific innovation of the atom was split, it was known that matter was no longer solid nor stable. This was particularly affected by the advances of physicists like Einstein, very intellectual, well-read in philosophy, religion, history, and the arts. In addition to that, Kandinsky also studied music. He related music to the orchestration of color, form, line, and space. His improvisation paintings, as we see here, are artworks that are attempting to capture in paint the actual effects of music. So again, relating to that emotive response that one receives from listening to music, Kandinsky is now trying to recreate this visually. Our next artistic movement is Cubism. Cubism is an early 20th century art movement that rejected naturalistic depictions, preferring compositions of shapes and forms abstracted from the conventionally perceived world. Two artists that we will, well, mainly one that we'll be looking at, but one that you guys might be very familiar with, is Pablo Picasso and the lesser known George Braque. Pablo Picasso was a Spanish artist. He left behind his academic training in representational art and started to explore experimental approaches. He is noted in his early stages as having a radical handling of form and shape. George Brock was a French artist who actually worked with Picasso to develop Cubism. Cubism, mainly existing between 1908 and 1914, emphasized geometry instead of illusionism. You also have two main categorizations. One is analytic cubism. So this was the first phase of cubism developed by Picasso and Brock. So what we see is the analysis of, analysis of the structure of form and the dissection of forms in space. So think of different planes of existence kind of simultaneously moving um, in a singular space. Synthetic cubism cubism is a later phase and we in this part you have the collage or a cut and pasted objects on some sort of support which was radically new technique for the time. Brock initially began his career as a Fauvis painter in France and worked with Picasso to develop cubism in 1908. So it was the belief that the art of painting had to move far beyond the depiction of reality. So this is a radical turning point, basically dismissing pictorial illusion that had been so popular since the High Renaissance and rejecting naturalistic, naturalistic depictions. 
as well. This is a sort of visual analysis of form that is very similar to Cezanne's style of dissecting space. This particular painting called The Portuguese, painted in 1911, a Portuguese musician recalled many years later actually by the artist. So we see the form of this Portuguese musician in a dynamic intersection with surrounding space. So the idea here is to insinuate that space is indefinite. There are subdued hues so there are not bright colors of the Phobos, for example, and that is specifically to focus or have greater con concentration on the forms and line. So the viewers must actually work to discover the clues of the subject. If you look closely, you can see that there is parts of a man as well as a guitar. Cubes suggest both chiaroscuro and transparent space. So there is a sense of the solid and of the void. There is also the insertion in the top left as well as the top right of flat text. So this is giving us the idea of two and three dimensional space in a singular composition. Our next movement is Futurism. Futurism is an early 20th century Italian art movement whose artists decided that motion itself was the new glory of the 20th century and attempted to depict it in their art. So futurists celebrated dynamic movement, progress, and modern technology, aligned with political beliefs that were later to become known as fascists. So they, in their art are expressing a contempt for the past. So it is a hope instead for positive changes as a result of World War I. The well-defined agenda was conveyed in a manifest by Antoni Marinetti in 1909. A manifesto is a public declar or excuse me, a public declaration often political in nature, of a group or individual's principles, beliefs, and intended course of action. The Futurist Manifesto by Marinetti aggressively advocated revolution not only in art but also in society. So this was thought to usher in a new, more enlightened era, such as was brought in by the German Expressionist. So in this, this is a selection from the Futurist Manifesto by Marianetti. So I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to read this, and we have it continued on the next slide. And I want you to think carefully about what Marianetti is saying in his manifesto. As you guys are reading this, I want to first note the idea of the past. So in the beginning of this part, we see Marionetti. He's saying, why should we look back when what we want is to break down the mysterious doors of the impossible? So in the futurist opinion, all artwork that had been created beforehand, all historical events, 
everything that had happened in the past was obsolete. It was an obstruction in the desire to move forward. So we see this emphasis on movement coming into play in the visualizations of futurist art. Giacomo Bala is a very famous futurist artist. So what we see here is that Bala is breaking very radically with tradition here. So the quote unquote rules of academic painting for depicting the human body certainly did not include the duplication or multiplication of parts of the figure. If there are more than two arms, for example, it would clearly have been a mythological figure. However, what Boccioni is doing is breaking down movement into separate positions rather than simply implying it. Something just started to make an appearance in art, like the Cubist paintings, and it was very influenced by scientific and photographic studies of motion using the innovations of the camera. Think back to the invention of photography, um, the use of the camera. We talked about Moybridge's series with the horse race. Um, so this is giving us these studies of motion. So the question becomes in a flat two-dimensional surface or in a sculpture, how does an artist imply motion? So what we see here is the use of diagonal lines. Notice the dramatic diagonals that compose the ground, essentially, that could be a sidewalk. Further repeated to add a sense of dynamism. The abstracts and fractures of the picture plane are rendered in a way that sacrifices pictorial realism for dynamic movement and speed. Even the title hints at the idea of taking a banal subject, uh, thinking of the subject of a dog at a person's feet, or it's just kind of an ordinary person who's walking their dog. It is not a very interesting in subject, but the term dynamism itself implies heroism. So here it is the elevation of the modern machine world, both incredibly interesting and apt given the context, but it's also a bit strange. Their feet seem to outpace their bodies, a conundrum that results in implied frenzied scampering. Think to if you guys have ever had a little bit of stress where maybe you're late for an important event or you're trying to gather all of your materials for an assignment that is due in an hour or any type of situation like that, you feel as if your life is put on fast forward where you are frantically moving here and about just to try and complete one specific action. So this is the kind of feeling and frenzy that futurist artists like Giacomo Bala are trying to achieve. Another famous futurist artist is Boccioni. Here we see his sculpture titled Unique Forms of Continuity in Space, made in 1913. So Umberto Boccioni was an Italian futurist and an actual co-signer of the Futurist Manifesto. He worked initially as a painter, but also worked in drawings, prints, and sculptures. And he would become an increasingly interested in sculpture by 1912 while working in Paris. And what we see here in Boccioni's sculpture, it was originally made in plaster, then cast in bronze after Boccioni's death. And we see the figure itself kind of forcefully striding, almost so much that it seems superhuman. It seems to be a symbol of vitality and strength. So this is connected to the unique conditions of the modern era. For example, the blur of the figure seems very similar to the blur of forms when viewing modern transportation. The sculpture for Boccioni 
becomes a mean for expressing dynamic movement, one that is powerful and full of vitality through distortion and fragmentation. Our next artistic movement is known as Dada. Dada is very much related, or at least um, surrealism, with artists like Salvador Dali, uh, Marcel Duchamp will be seeing come out a little bit more prominently. Um, just a side note as well, an exhibition at the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg is highlighting the works of Marcel Duchamp as well as Salvador Dali's creations with Marcel Duchamp. Actually, many of the artworks that we'll be seeing in this presentation are actually available at the Dali Museum right now. So if you guys have a chance to, I strongly suggest that you go over to the St. Pete Museum and check out the Duchamp exhibition. So Dada was an early 20th century artistic movement that was prompted by a revulsion against the horror of World War I. So these artists were very struck with a kind of disbelief as to how humanity could treat one another in this war, and they embraced political anarchy, the irrational, and the intuitive. So there's a sort of disdain for convention that we see in their artwork. You have elements of humor and whimsy that is characteristic of the art produced. The Dada movement actually starts in Zurich in Switzerland, which was neutral at the time of World War I. And we see the protested rational thought that had actually led to war. So interestingly, the name Dada was chosen at random from the dictionary. It was a sort of anti-art and actually refused to be called a movement. However, it did spread to the U.S., Berlin, Cologne, Paris, Russia, Eastern Europe, and even Japan. Dada works are characterized by sculptural objects, performances and events, publications, posters, and pamphlets. They often are critical, but also playful. They focus on individuality, irrationality, chance, and imagination. Duchamp, or Marcel Duchamp, was a French artist. He was a key figure in the New York branch of Dada. So in the Dada movement, you have World War I that is creating this tumultuous situations in Europe. So many of these artists would actually flee to America. So you have the transference of artistic tendencies in Europe, and now all of these avant-garde artists are coming to America. So American art starts to take a very different turn. Marcel Duchamp would coin the term ready-made. As seen in these two artworks here, there is essentially the idea of being free from consideration of being either good or bad taste. So in a way, he is sort of subverting the institution. So I want you guys to take a moment to think about what makes something a work of art or what is art supposed to accomplish? Who is it for? So thinking about this, when we're looking at Marcel Duchamp's images, so we have what is called the fountain, which is the urinal on the left, and we have the object on the right, which is composed of a stool and a bike wheel. So these ready-mades were a toy, uh, excuse me, a coin termed by Marcel Duchamp, meaning something that is already made that the artist simply puts together in a new combination. So ask yourselves if Marcel Duchamp's sculpture actually fulfills any of your criteria for something that can be called a work of art. This next one is uh, one of my favorites. It's uh, likewise uh, in the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, uh, currently, so I do urge you guys to see this. As we can see, Duchamp has taken the very famous artwork of Leonardo da Vinci, the Mona Lisa, and reappropriated 
reappropriated it to reflect the kind of social ideals of the Dada movement during World War I. So this object in particular is art because the quote-unquote artwork lied in the artist's choice of the object. Duchamp takes a cheap re reproduction of the Mona Lisa and embellish it, embellishes it with a moustache, a goatee, and an inscription. The title itself, L-H-O-O-Q, is a phonetic game when played out by the artist. So when read quickly in French, L-H-O-O-Q sounds like l a ch o a q so this sounds like a sentence that translates colloquially as basically she has a hot ass. Duchamp himself gave a loose translation of L-H-O-O-Q as there is a fire down below in a later in interview about the artwork. Other scholars have noted that in English L-H-O-O-Q sounds like the word look perhaps commenting on the relationship between the artist and viewer. The tongue-in-cheek nature of this artwork is intentionally irreverent. On the one hand, it is a critique on the mass production, tourist icon that the Mona Lisa had become in the 20th century, and this Dadaist intervention redeems the Renaissance masterpiece from the banality of reproduction, instead returning it to the unique act of creation. On the other hand, it's the artist's reinterpretation of the Mona Lisa. It's actually somewhat of a Freudian joke, turning this famous beauty, essentially, into a man. This is based on the idea that some have argued that Leonardo da Vinci himself was actually a homosexual who suppressed his sexual life for art, suggested by some scholars in somewhat ambiguity of gender in Leonardo da Vinci's figures. One of the best Dada artists was a female artist named Hannah Hogg, the artwork of which we can see on this slide. This particular artwork was displayed in the International Art Fair. 1919 to 1920 is a moment of political chaos in the wake of World War I. There's tensions between the far left and other factions, and we see this reflected in Hawke's work. So it contrasts with the long war shown in fragmentations, basically what happens after war. And she does this using a new technique known as photo montage. So photo montage basically is an assemblage of photographs. So it's using the same principle that was behind the Cubist collage, but with some different underlying ideas than Cubism, which are obviously reinforced by the title. The title, we can see, is Cut with a Kitchen Knife, Dada Through the Last Weimar Beer Belly, Cultural Epoch of Germany. So let's pick apart this title firstly. So cutting. This is a violent act as World War I cut through the fabric of life during this time. So she's reconstructing the world in a way that makes sense to her. Kitchen knife. The role of women is also at the fore here, basically visualized in different ways. But this wasn't a sort of insider meaning as well but it's a comment on the conditions of contemporary reality and society. So it actually includes photographs of current and historical people with text about Dada in a political and social context. So the act of cutting and assembling was an activity used to create new, unexpected meanings. So let's look at the iconography of the work. Firstly, we can see that there's images of gears that are especially pronounced, the artist now becomes a sort of mental engineer. This is not painting as such, um, being an old traditional technique and medium, 
There was a tension with this kind of art that had supported and fed into the culture that led to World War I. So photo montage offered an alternative mode of art making. It's the idea of the artist immersing oneself in contemporary society and technology. Photography, for example, is the more concurrent with the now, and it is seen as more democratic. In this image, photographs are being used to shock the viewer. Arrangements are at first bizarre, with interesting juxtapositions, shifting scales, etc. This is not an immersion with nature, but the world of industry, workers, and revolt. It is not an escape, but present in reality, more so a call to action. So let's take a look at some of the details of Hannah Hawk's painting, as there is much to look at. The man who led Germany into the world was Kaiser Wilhelm. So what we see are two wrestlers in place of his mustache. So this is, in essence, making fun of him. We also see the defeated field marshals on his shoulders. You have other generals above with machine gun and text, which reads, Die anti Dada, meaning the anti Dada movement. These are the people, Wilhelm, as well as these generals who were, were responsible for the war. Many of them, at the time when Hannah Hawk produced this artwork, were still in power. We can see Albert Einstein represented here, and the word Dada actually seems to be coming from his head. Near his mouth, he says, hey, young man, Dada is more than just an art trend, meaning it is something more meaningful, that it is not only political, but worldly. So there are these kind of propagandistic messages, but with a hint of absurdity. We also see Karl Marx represented, who was the communist leader of the Soviet Union, on the right side of the composition with the text anti-Dada, the female that we see here is Kathy Kollowitz, who was an important ballerina. So we see that she is in the sense of movement, but there is also a sense of decapitation as her head is no longer attached to her body. By this time, Dada artists saw expressionist painters as participating in the corrupt society. So by this time, expressionism was a very fashionable style and actually sold very well to the general public. Here we can see Karl Liebknecht, a communist party leader, along with Rosa Luxemburg. He was tortured and assassinated in 1918. And what we see here is that he's saying, join Dada, basically saying this to the masses. If you look at the large amount of people that are surrounding the central figure. So the message is once again, essentially cutting through the last Weimar beer belly, the last vestiges of the wealthy bourgeois that had allowed this war to happen. The Surrealist movement was a successor to the Dada movement. This is what you guys might be more familiar with, uh, particularly the work of Salvador Dali, which we will see here in a moment. The Surrealist, or the Surrealist movement incorporated the improvisational nature of its predecessor, meaning the Dada movement, into its exploration of the ways to express in art the world of dreams and the unconscious. So we see the paintings being based on the ideas of Austrian psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. So there is an emphasis on psychoanalysis, the unconscious mind and what kind of images we might see, as well as dreams and the images that come along with that. So like Dada, surrealism was opposed to rationality and convention. They aimed to challenge the idea of objective reality, so they wanted to really bring aspects of not just the outer reality, but also the inner reality together. 
The first Surrealist Manifesto was published in 1924. In the manifesto, author André Breton defined Surrealism as masculine, pure psychic automatism that expresses the true function of thought, the kind of thought free of control and outside aesthetic or moral conditions. We should note especially the word masculine here. There is an implicit valuation of the male creative genius. Women in the Surrealist movement were suitable subjects for exploring ideas of sexuality and desire, but tended to be implicitly devalued as creative forces in their own right, which is part of the reason why there are not many female Surrealists. However, if you do get a chance, I do suggest that you look up female Surrealist artists such as Kay Sage, Eleanor Carrington. They have some excellent artworks that unfortunately are not as highlighted because the Surrealist movement was a very male-dominated movement. Moreover, these artists define Surrealism as something that valued, above all, dreams, the unconscious, free thought, and chance. So, finally, it is a movement that rejects conventional notions of art. This included a lot of artists, many of them that were previously engaged with Dada, but the work of the Surrealist artists do not share much stylistic symmetry. Rather, what binds them together is more ideologically and conceptually based, very similar to the Dada movement. So what we see here is that Marcel Duchamp joined in 1927 with the opening of the Surrealist Gallery, but Dali would not join until 1929 when he actually visited Paris. So Salvador Dali was a Spanish-born artist who was very interested in Sigmund Freud's writings on psychology. Freud was an Austrian psychologist writing in the late 19th and early 20th century who revolutionized the way people think about the mind with his theory of the unconscious. The unconscious is part of the psyche that thinks and feels without the person being aware of those thoughts and feelings. According to Freud, dreams are coded messages from the unconscious, and surrealist artists were interested in what could be revealed by their dreams. Freud believed it was a great place of pl power, closely linked to the forces of the libido, or sexual desire, and control, or repression, so social behavior and institutions which channeled the libido into acceptable forms. So that would be censoring of certain images, whereas we all know that we have these certain humanistic urges. The unconscious mind then emerges when control and repression are less, such as when you dream. So this results in what is termed as a Freudian slip when you reveal something that might be terrifying, disquieting, or unfamiliar. Influenced by Freud's writings on the dreams and the unconscious, Dali self-induced hallucinations in order to access his unconscious while creating works of art. He called this the paranoic critical method. It's the creation of a visionary realm or visionary reality from elements of visions, dreams, memories, and psychological or pathological distortions. On the results of this process, Dali wrote, quote, I am the first to be surprised and often terrified by the images I see appear upon my canvas. I register without choice and with all possible exactitude, the dictates of my subconscious, my dreams. Although he claimed to be surprised by the images, Dali rendered them with meticulous precision, creating the illusion that these places could exist in a real world. As we discussed with Giotto's Arena Chapel, 
Dali uses the idea of trompe l'oeil techniques where he makes concrete images from his imagination. So this blurs the distinction between dream and reality. This is his very famous persistence of memory. So what we see here is a kind of haunting allegory of empty space where time has ended. So let's take a look at the individual parts and how this reflects Dolly's inner psychological landscape. So firstly, we are in a sort of eerie, barren landscape. We have some cliffs in the background where which were actually based off of cliffs that Dali was familiar with from Spain. We have this figure, or this kind of amorphous creature, draped with a pocket watch in the center. This is actually a self-portrait of Salvador Dali. He was very afraid of impotence and as such created these kind of flaccid forms to reflect that fear. We also see many clocks melting in the idea that the clocks or time is a man-made construction rather than being something that is just inherently found in nature. We also see, if you take a look at the pocket watch in the bottom left corner, we can see that it's filled with these ants and flies. So the presence of these insects hints at Dolly's fear of death. When you die, your body succumbs to nature. It is enveloped, reabsorbed, and reprocessed. So the idea of insects as feasting as scavengers on the bodily flesh is replicated here instead on the clock. Joan Miro is another surrealist artist who is quite famous. Um, he's very well known for his paintings as well as his assemblages. So an assemblage is very similar to a photo montage, except that an assemblage is a three-dimensional object. So in this case, we see a stuffed parrot on a wooden perch. There's stuffed silk stocking with velvet garter and doll's paper shoes suspended in a hollow woman wooden frame. There's also a derby hat, a hanging cork ball, a fish, and an engraved mat. So there are all of these identifiable objects, but they are arranged in a juxtaposition that is very unfamiliar. So this becomes kind of the quintessential nature of the Surrealist movement itself. So for April 25th's lecture, we will be discussing the late modern and contemporary movements of art. So again, review your PowerPoint presentations, make sure to complete your notes and your journals as well. Until next time, I'll see you guys then.